Brother D. Lash, serving as an elder at Westminster, Colorado, will be in charge. That all might enjoy the drama to the fullest, it has been asked that no one be allowed on the stage or near it during the drama as the aerial will be needed by the participants. Please do not block someone else's view by either standing up or coming down just a little closer to take pictures. Your quick Christian cooperation will be appreciated by all. Thank you. And now the drama, Keep Your Minds Fixed on the Things Above. Brother Lash. In the first century of our common era, the Apostle John said, If we make the statement we have no sin, we are misleading ourselves and the truth is not in us. However, we can comfort ourselves in John's further statement, All unrighteousness is sin, and yet there's a sin that does not incur death. Does this mean, then, that we do not need to be overly concerned about these sins? That we need not take particular note of them until we've committed a sin that does incur death? Before we were baptized as disciples of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we repented and turned around from the wrong course we'd been following, recognizing ourselves as sinners and making a request to God for a good conscience. And we became reconciled with God through his son's atoning sacrifice. Did that end our need for repentance? That is, unless we fell into some major sin, the kind that does incur death? What are the circumstances that cause us to fall into such gross sin? What state of mind precedes it? The Bible drama that we're going to consider now is designed to provide an opportunity for self-scrutiny. It should cause each one of us to ask himself, where are my interests centered? Where is my thinking directed? It's entitled, Keep Your Minds Fixed on the Things Above. And we'll be introduced to this theme as we listen to brother and sister New and their daughter Peggy when they approach Brother Olderman with a question. They're all here in the Kingdom Hall following the service meeting. Blessing. It's been a long, hard pull. We're so glad you met us. Jehovah has been very merciful to me. We can always turn to the other Brother Olderman, may I ask you a question? Of course, Brother New. What is it? Linda and Peggy and I were just talking about the announcement that was made at the conclusion of the meeting this evening. You know about Brother Newhart. We knew, of course, that Brother Newhart had been disfellowshipped. He always sits by himself at the back of the Kingdom Hall or has in the few months we've been coming anyway. I remember the first meeting we attended. We asked why no one would talk to him. It looked so strange. Everyone else was so friendly. And someone told us that he was disfellowshipped and the brothers couldn't talk to him. We didn't want to ask too many questions then. But now, but... we'd like for you to explain to us what's really happened. I see. What is it that you don't understand, Bob? Well, the announcement this evening. Brother Shepherd said that Brother Newhart was being reinstated and that now the brothers could offer him the hand of fellowship. I think that's the expression that was used. Yes, that's right. How can a person who's been put out of the congregation ever be taken back again? Because he's had a change of heart. What do you mean, a change How can you know of what's in someone's heart? Well, we can't look into someone's heart, it's true. But Jesus said the way a man thinks in his heart, that's the way he is. It does make the responsibility of the judicial committee a difficult one, but in time, a man shows what's in his heart by what he does. I see. Mm. You see, when a member of the congregation commits a gross sin, 
in direct violation of Christian principles, he shows his heart is not right. And if he doesn't show repentance, then he must be disfellowshipped. That is, he must be separated from the congregation in such a way that he doesn't participate in any of the activities of the congregation, and the brothers completely ignore him. But he can attend meetings at the Kingdom Hall. Yes, if he's so inclined, but he must sit quietly and listen, and he is not permitted to speak. Then what would cause him to change? Well, he may eventually realize that he failed to keep his mind fixed on the things above, which led him into a course out of harmony with God's principles. He may become truly repentant at heart and show this by a completely changed course of action. Then it's possible for him to be reinstated into fellowship with the congregation. Is that what happened with a new heart? Now, Peggy, don't go too far with your questions. Well, I... It's all right, Bob. He couldn't have been reinstated if he hadn't realized his mistake in the past. We're glad, Peggy, that he's not prepared to make a new life for himself in Jehovah's service. What I can't understand is how can anyone in the truth allow himself to do something that would cause him to be put outside? Everyone who commits a wrongdoing isn't necessarily disfellowship. I know. But one thing we must be careful of. What's that? The scripture says, let him that thinks he is standing beware that he does not fall. You mean we can get overconfident? Yes. Thinking that we're so firmly established in our relationship with Jehovah that nothing can take us away. This can cause us to ignore warnings that may come our way. And before we know it, we're caught and can fall. Well, I know I wouldn't want to do anything that would cause that. And that's the way we should always feel. But circumstances can develop that some may not immediately recognize are dangerous. Now, suppose someone like this is not being cautious and doesn't avoid these circumstances. Suppose instead he allows himself to become more deeply involved in them. He could get into trouble, couldn't he? Serious trouble, Peggy. His thinking could be changed so quickly that almost before he realizes it, he's committed some act which is in direct violation of God's law. Well, Linda and I have only been baptized for about two months now. I'm being baptized at the next circuit assembly. No, Peggy. We're happy for you. But, well, we know the things that would cause us to be disfellowshipped, so I'm sure those who are disfellowshipped are aware of them. Yes. What is it that prevents them from avoiding these things? It isn't just overconfidence, is it? No, there are a number of causes. But in almost every case, it begins the same way. Seldom is serious or gross sin committed without some preliminary inclination. You mean he plans it? Well, not necessarily from the very beginning. Here, let me show you. It's in the letter of James, chapter 1, and uh, we'll begin reading with verse 13. When under trial, let no one say, I am being tried of God. For with evil things God cannot be tried, nor does he himself try anyone. But each one is being tried by being drawn out and enticed by his own desire. Then the desire, when it has become fertile, gives birth to sin. In turn, sin, when it has been accomplished, brings forth death. I don't understand Could you what... explain that just a little? You see, James is pointing out that our trial comes when we're tempted. The more we dwell on wrong practices, the more our desire is kindled. And when our desire has been fanned into a sufficiently strong flame, all we need, really, are the right circumstances, and we're consumed by that desire until it's satisfied. If we've allowed it to get that strong, it will override any love that we have for God and for his principles, and we blind ourselves momentarily to our relationship to Jehovah. Then we may start planning to satisfy this wrong desire that has assumed complete control of us. And when we do satisfy that desire, we've sinned. And if we make a practice of sin, we're led into the course of death then the desire is built up over a period of time. Usually, but not necessarily so. It seems from the Bible account of Eve's transgression that it happened to her just while she was looking at the fruit. And in just that short time, 
her destiny was completely reversed. I never thought Exactly, that. Bob. And it can happen to any of us if we fail to keep our minds fixed on the things above. It's a little frightening, isn't it? It should be, Peggy. How can we know when our desires have become that strong? Well, usually we can't. But that's just the point. Not until we suddenly wake up and realize we've actually been overtaken in sin. But I'm sure, Brother Olderman, that I read in one of the publications uh, we all have these tendencies and desires deep inside of us. We do, Bob. We're all imperfect. And that's why we should never become too sure of ourselves. And if we keep trying to get as close as we can to the borderline, someday, when the circumstances are just right for it, these desires can swell up in us and begin to take complete hold of us. And we're led as a bull by a nose ring to the satisfying of those desires. The proverb says, Can a man rake fire into his bosom and yet his very garments not be burned? Then the best way to avoid falling into sin is to refuse to consider any seeming advantages it might have. And we ought to do that just as soon as they come into our mind. Immediately, Bob. Don't give them any room whatsoever. And you won't if your mind is fixed on the things above. That's why Paul said what he did at Ephesians 5, verses 3 to 5. Here, Bob, read this, please. Okay. Let fornication and uncleanness of every sort or greediness not even be mentioned among you, just as it befits holy people. Neither shameful conduct, nor foolish talking, nor obscene jesting, things that are not becoming, but rather the giving of thanks. For you know this, recognizing it for yourselves, that no fornicator or unclean person or greedy person, which means being an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You see, Paul relates the thinking about these things to the doing of them because the thinking leads almost inevitably to the doing. Didn't Jesus say something like that, too, in his uh, Sermon on the Mount? Yes, he did. In fact, he said, uh, but here, let's read it. Matthew uh, 5, verse 27. Bob, would you read this, please? Okay. You heard that it was said, you must not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone that keeps on looking at a woman so as to have a passion for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Uh, Brother Olderman, those are very strong words. Uh, according to Jesus, thinking about committing adultery is the same as doing it. Thinking about it and dwelling on it, yes, because the thinking of lustful thoughts not only leads one to follow an immoral course, but the one thinking such thoughts is as much as saying to himself, if I only had the opportunity and could get away with it, this is what I'd do. But that's wrong. Of course it is, Peggy. And anyone deliberately thinking thoughts like that has no place in the righteous arrangement of God. He's unclean and a threat to the cleanness of the organization. In due time, these tendencies will most certainly come to the surface, and the wrongdoing that results will have to be dealt with accordingly. I might give you an example of that from the Bible. Oh, please do, Brother Olderman. David was certainly an example of one who feared Jehovah and who had a deep and well-motivated desire to serve him faithfully. And yet David committed a very gross sin with Bathsheba. Oh, we came across that story in our family Bible reading some time ago. I remember. I'm not sure where it was now, but I, I think it was in the book of Samuel. Yes. 2 Samuel, chapters 11 and 12. There were some things about the account that uh, we weren't clear on, Brother Olderman. Didn't David scheme to take another man's wife away from him? No, not at the outset anyway. Apparently, David got caught in a network of circumstances, circumstances largely of his own making, when he failed or refused to curb his passions but allowed them to have full reign and when he didn't recognize immediately that he'd sinned and change his course of action, he went from one bad act into another. But he did finally realize it, didn't he? Yes, in David's case, his sincere love for Jehovah finally won out. But that is not always true in similar circumstances. 
And we should never use the example of David as a license to commit a wrong act, thinking that we can go to Jehovah afterward and ask forgiveness and we'll automatically be made right with him. That is not the way it happened to David. But um, didn't Bathsheba have something to do with it? Didn't she um, entice him in some way? The Bible account gives no indication that she did. It's true that she was bathing where David was able to see her, but the Bible does not even suggest that she did it either deliberately or knowingly. But if she was bathing where he could see her, wouldn't that suggest that she was wrong too? I always thought she shared in responsibility for their wrong act. She may have. We can't say for sure. And our sisters today should be very careful that they don't inadvertently put temptation in someone's way. But again, there's nothing in the Bible account to show that a judgment was entered against her for her part in this wrong act. It's true she suffered as a result of it. Apparently she suffered very much. And this may have been a punishment to her. But the judgment was entered against David himself. And he was the one whom Jehovah said must pay as a consequence of the act. But did she have to give in to him? Remember, Peggy, conditions were different in those days. Women had certain protections under the law of Israel, but wives were still obtained by payment of a bride price. So the husband was viewed as the owner and a woman was strictly subject to her husband. Imagine then how they'd view the king. David was the king, and that's the authority that ancient kings exercised over their subjects. Jehovah warned Israel that it would be like that when they asked for a king, and here's an instance where it proved to be true. Would you mind refreshing our memories a little more about what occurred? It might help. Not at all. I'd be glad to. Of course, all of the details are not too specifically spelled out in the Bible. But it might well have happened something like this. Does my lord the king wish anything? No, Rhea, I, I have just this moment risen from my bed and feel refreshed from my late afternoon nap. I must report an unfortunate matter, my lord, one that affects my lord the king in that it involves one of the servants of my lord, one of the servants caring for the table of my lord. Speak, Rhea, what is the nature of this matter? It seems, my lord, that this good-for-nothing fellow was caught lying with the wife of one of the bakers. And what has been done with them? They were taken before the older men whom you have appointed as judges in the city gate. The judges found them guilty and ordered that they both be taken outside the city and be stoned to death. Well, did either show any remorse for their bad deed? None, my lord. They were both defiant down to the last. Then they deserve to die. It is the law in Israel. No one is to uncover the nakedness of his neighbor's wife. There were no tears shed for them, my lord. Only gladness that their folly has been cleared out of Israel. It is good, Rei. See that another man, a fit man, is given his assignment of service. As you say, my lord. But tell me, Rei, has any word come from Ammon? I'm somewhat concerned about Joab at Rabbah. No word arrived this afternoon, my lord. But you need have no concern for Joab and the army at Rabbah. Hanan the son of Nahash or the sons of Ammon will regret the day that he insulted the ambassadors of David, the king of Israel. The valiant men of my lord's army and Joab himself will see to it. May it be even so, Rei. Uh, but now I think I'll step out onto the rooftop for a breath of air. Cool evening breeze of springtime always takes me back to the fields of Bethlehem, 
and the flocks of my father. At this time of the year particularly, all the works of Jehovah's hand become so clearly manifest. It all makes the war with the sons of Ammon seem so far away. It does indeed, my lord. My nephew Elkina has just returned from Jericho and he tells me that the ambassadors of my lord are doing quite well. Their beards have nearly grown to the full again and Elkina reports Rehai. that... Yes, my lord? Whose house is this below me? The small one between the house of Hushai and the one to the right that has the roof garden. You mean the small one with the enclosed courtyard? Yes, that's the one. That's the house of Uriah the Hittite, my lord. Uriah the Hittite. He's one of the mighty men of the military forces of Israel. As you say, my lord, he is even now serving in the army of my lord the king with Joab at Rabbah. Then he's been gone for some weeks. Tell me, Rei, does he have a wife? Indeed he does, my lord, a most beautiful woman. Are there any other women in the household? A maid servant or two, perhaps. He has no children. And uh, what is the name of Uriah's wife? Her name is Bathsheba, my lord. She is the daughter of Eliam. It is good, Rei. Now, you may go. I'll call you if I have any further need. As you say, my lord. Never have I seen so beautiful a woman bathing in the seclusion of her own courtyard, yet visible to me from the vantage of the rooftop of my own house. The deep shadows of evening creeping across the courtyard cannot conceal the beauty of her form and the grace of her every movement. See how the soft rays of the setting sun shimmer upon her ebony hair and are captured by every droplet of crystal water clinging to the freshly oiled surface of her skin. Why can I not tear myself away from this entrancing vision? She is the wife of another man, one of the valiant men of my armed forces, even now fighting the sons of Ammon in defense of the honor of Israel. I will leave. Now. I will return to my room, recline upon my couch, and forget what I've seen. But no. I cannot. I have looked too long. I have seen too much. My heart and mind bear the brand marks of her enticing beauty, and they cannot be erased. Am I not the king? I will send for this woman and take her. She must be mine. I can no longer live until she is locked in my embrace. Rei! But wait. Though I am the king, I must conceal my motive. For her sake, I must make some pretext. Rei! You call, my lord? Send for the wife of Uriah the Hittite. I would speak with her. Now, my lord? At once, Rei. Do not delay. Uh, go yourself and take one of the servants with you. As you say, my lord. It shall be done at once. She is gone. She has concluded her bathing and must now be dressing. It is good. Now it will be only a moment before she arrives. And then... I'll play on my harp. Perhaps it will soothe the turbulence of my spirit and stifle this hesitancy that continues to strike my soul. Why did I send for her? Was not my desire already kindled when she was as far away as the courtyard of her own house? What am I to do when she is here, alone with me in this room? How can I do this thing? The wife of one of my valiant men. 
but I cannot turn back. This flame inside of me will not be put down. Still, I must not frighten her, even though I am the king. Here, let me see. Even so, there is wine. I'll speak to her of other matters for a while, and then, when her mind has been put at ease... But listen, I hear someone approaching. Come in. It is Bathsheba, my lord, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Come, my sister. I would speak with you. Oh, my lord. Do you have news of my husband? I know only that he is well. Oh, Jehovah be praised. You may go now, Rei. I'll call if I need you. But how then may I serve my lord the king? See, I am your maidservant. Here, my sister. Sit here. It is only that I would comfort you in the absence of your husband. You are most kind, my lord. But what is it with me? And what have I done that my lord the king should exercise such loving kindness toward me? And how is it that I have found favor in your eyes so that I am taken notice of when I am but the maidservant of my lord? Are you not the wife of one of my valiant men? And is he not even now fighting in the army of Israel? Here's wine. Do not be afraid, my sister. Do you not know that wine makes the heart of mortal man rejoice? I would have you in a pleasant mood, my sister. As you say, my lord. And your eye has been away for some time. Do you miss him? I do, my lord. He is my husband. This night is not one to be alone. The rainy season itself is past. The downpour is over. Blossoms themselves have appeared in the land. And the voice of the turtle dove itself has been heard. Look, even the vines are abloom. And their fragrance reaches here to the rooftop. It is even so, my lord. A most delightful fragrance. My head was restless upon my couch, and I could not sleep. I stepped out onto my rooftop, and there, just now, I saw a sight to delight the eyes. <gasps> like heady wine that stirs the senses and clouds <gasps> the reason. Oh, my Lord! You saw me! Bathing! <gasps> oh! Oh, you most beautiful one among women. You have made my heart beat, oh, my sister. You have made my heart beat by the beauty of your stature and the grace of your every movement. Oh, no. The fragrance of your oils is better than all sorts of perfume. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. What is this that you would have me do? No, my lord, please. Do not humiliate me. For it is not usual to do that way in Israel. Do not cause me to engage in this disgraceful folly. And I, where shall I cause my reproach to go? And you, you will become like, like one of the... A garden barred in is my sister, my loved one. A garden barred in, a spring sealed up. Your skin is a paradise of pomegranates with the choicest fruits, along with all sorts of trees of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes, along with all the finest perfumes, and a spring of gardens, a well of fresh water, and trickling streams from Lebanon. No, my lord, please. Await, O oh north wind, and come in, O oh south wind. Breathe upon my garden. Let its Perfumes trickle. Oh, my lord, the king. What is there for me to do, my lord? Should I even fight against the king? 
Let my lord come into his garden and eat its choicest fruits. You sent for Bathsheba, my lord. Come, Bathsheba. You may go, Rei. Oh, my lord, the king. What have I done? What have I done? What will become of Uriah? And what am I to do now that I have become pregnant with your child? Do not be afraid, my little sister, the beloved one. And do not accuse yourself because of this thing that has happened to you. Was it not I myself that sent for you that evening some days ago? And did not I myself persuade you to lie down with me? But, my lord, I have sinned. I have brought disgrace upon my husband Uriah and upon his house. And it is certain that when he finds out what I have done, that he will hate me. I am a woman who deserves to die, who should be taken to the city gate and stoned to death. Never may that happen. Not one hair of your head shall be harmed. I will see to it myself. But how can that be, my lord? Soon all my neighbors will know that I am pregnant and my husband has been gone now for these many weeks. Will they not all say, look, Bathsheba has played the harlot. And will they not all turn on me and stone me? <laughs> Be at peace, my sister. This is not the way it will turn out for you. If Uriah had slept with you, and then it became known that you were pregnant, would your neighbors reproach you and call down evil upon you? Of course not, my lord. They would all rejoice with me that I had become fruitful. But Uriah has Even not. so. But if he were yet to come into you and lie down with you, would it not um, still be the same? My lord, I don't know. See now, my sister. Here is what I have purposed to do. I will send to Joab and have Uriah, your husband, sent home to me. I will tell Joab that I would have news of the war from the lips of Uriah himself. Joab will do as I command him. Then when your husband arrives, I will speak to him of the war. And then I will send him home. And he must come into his house and eat and drink and lie down with you. And in this way, the mouths of your neighbors will be stopped. Oh, my lord, the king. How can I do this thing? How can I give myself to the arms of Uriah, my husband, with this guilt so heavy upon my heart? Will not my very shame betray me? You are a woman, Bathsheba, and a woman's love is deep. I cannot love Uriah with an open heart as I did formerly. Now that I have become another man. You are still the wife of Uriah, my sister. You belong to him, and I must restore you to him. Oh, my Lord. How can I heap guilt upon guilt? I have betrayed my husband. And now, would you have me conceal my shame in further deceit? It is a difficult thing you must do, my sister. But we have no other choice. Do not be afraid. In time, the child will be the same as if Uriah himself had fathered it. 
Each day would be for me another lie. Watching Uriah look upon the child as his own. And yet I, for my part, knowing the child is another man's, the child of my lord the king. Even so, my daughter, if Uriah were indeed to come into his own house and lie down with you, would it not be that the child were the same as his own? Could it not be that conception might have resulted from his act, the same as from mine? Let it be even so. I am my lord's maidservant. It shall be even as you have said. I will do just as my lord has directed. But what of Uriah, my lord? He is a man blameless and upright, fearing God and turning aside from bad. You know how he has adopted the true worship of our God Jehovah, and his loyalty to my lord the king is above reproach. I know that Uriah the Hittite is a valiant man. He is as though he were a natural son of our father Abraham. And the law of our God is written deep within his heart. Even now, he is engaged in the military campaign against the sons of Ammon. To him, it is a holy war. It is something sacred. It is Jehovah's war. Even so, my lord, when Uriah returns, I do not know what he will do. As you yourself have said, Uriah's loyalty to the king is above reproach. Uriah will do what I command. Then, if Uriah does indeed come to me, I, I will try to do as my lord the king has said. And may Uriah deal kindly with me. <laughs> Good morning, my lord. May Jehovah prosper your day. May Jehovah smile upon you too, Rei. What do you have to report this morning in regard to Uriah the Hittite? It is just the same this morning with Uriah, my lord, as it was yesterday. You mean Uriah did not go down to his house? It is just as you have spoken, my lord. Again this past night, just as the night before. Uriah lay down at the entrance of the king's house with all the other servants of my lord, and he did not go down to his own house. But did he not enjoy himself last night? Did I not call him in to me that he might eat and drink before me? Why then did he not go down to his own house again the second night? As you say, my lord, Uriah did indeed enjoy himself, and he was drunk. Nevertheless, when he went out in the evening, he lay down on his bed with the servants of my lord, and to his own house he did not go down. Very well, Rei. Please have him brought in to me. As you say, my lord. Who could have foreseen this turn of events? Here I had reasoned with myself that surely Uriah would welcome this opportunity to be with his wife. Is she not the most beautiful of all women? Has Uriah not been separated from her for these several weeks? Why then would he not go down to lie with her? These two days now. Just as I had commanded Joab, so he sent Uriah to me with news of the war. And when Uriah came in to me, I asked how Joab was getting along how the people were getting along, and how the war was getting along, and Uriah spoke to me in this way and in that. So finally I said to Uriah, Go down to your house and bathe your feet. And so Uriah went out from me, and my courtesy gift went out following him. But Uriah did not go down to his house. 
Instead, he lay down at the entrance of my house with all the other servants. And it was reported to me in the morning what he had done. And I called Uriah to me, and I detained him in the city for another day. And last evening we feasted and drank. But now still Uriah has not gone down to his own house. Who could have foreseen that this would happen? Certainly he has not heard. How could he possibly know that his wife has slept with another man? No, there must be another reason. But now I must seek some other way to save Bathsheba. Now for a certainty it will become known that Bathsheba is pregnant with the child of another man. Everyone knows that Uriah has been away these weeks, and when he returned he did not see his wife. How then could she become pregnant with his child? No, this thing must not be. I cannot allow this to happen. There must be be some other way. Hmm. Uriah is engaged in the war. If Uriah were to die, if indeed the sword of the sons of Ammon were to eat him up, then would not Bathsheba be free to marry another? And when her child is born, would it not then appear that the child were hers by, by this her second husband? But suppose Uriah does not die. Then for a certainty Bathsheba will. And this must not be. There is no other way. I will see to it. Uriah must return to the war today. And when he goes, hmm. when Uriah returns, I will send with him a letter to Joab. Here now, I must write it at once before Uriah arrives. To Joab, chieftain of the army of Israel, greetings. Here now, I send to you Uriah the Hittite, with this message. Press on in your siege of Rabbah, and bring the sons of Ammon to ruin. Also, put Uriah in front of the heaviest battle charges, and you men must retreat from behind him, and he must be struck down and die. So it must be. Uriah is here, my lord. Bring him in, Rei. At once, my lord. You slept well, Uriah? I did indeed, my lord. The banquet which you graciously invited me to last night was most pleasurable, and I slept soundly. And how was your wife? Excuse me, my lord, but I did not go down to my house last night. What? The second night also? Did I not say to you yesterday it is from a journey that you have come in? And did I not give you my permission from the first to go down to your own house and wash your feet, even sending along choice portions from my table? It is true, my lord. Why then have you not gone down to your house yet this second night? It is even as I told my lord yesterday. The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in booths, and my lord Joab in the service of my lord are camping on the face of the fields, and I... Shall I go down into my own house to eat and drink and to lie down with my wife? As you are living and as your soul is living, I shall not do this thing. Your zeal is commendable, my brother. But why would you, a Hittite, feel so strongly about war for Israel. I am no longer a Hittite, my lord the king. I am a circumcised alien resident in your land. Jehovah is my God, and it is Jehovah my king whom I would serve. Otherwise, why should I continue sanctified for the war? You speak well, Uriah. 
You may go then and return to the war. And when you arrive, give to Joab this letter which I have written. Hand it to him yourself, and see that it does not fall into the hands of another. It shall be done, even as you have said, my lord the king. As Jehovah is living, I will see to it myself. And may Jehovah prosper you, my lord the king, and may he grant the army of Israel success in destroying the sons of Ammon to the glory of my lord the king and to Jehovah's praise. So be it. from the war, but he did not come down to his house, and I have not seen him since he left at the beginning of the campaign. Now I am certain to be found out, and the disgrace is certain to come upon his house. It is even as you have said, Bathsheba, but Uriah was determined that he might remain sanctified for the war. He could not be dissuaded in the matter. He is a man of strong principles. He does not deserve what I have done to him. And now, it is certain even to be worse for him. And the disgrace that I have brought upon his house will, for a fact, bring him down to Sheol. <laughs> Why did we ever allow all of this to begin? It is out of our hands now, Bathsheba. What must be, will be. It is concerning this very matter that I have sent for you. I am a woman as good as dead, my lord. Why do you continue to show loving kindness toward me and to trouble your soul over me? Let me go down to the elders at the city gate and confess this disgraceful folly that I have committed. And then let me die. I will not reveal to them by whom it was that I am pregnant. Never must it be so. And now it need not be so. What do you mean, my lord? There is yet a way for you to escape and to save you from bringing shame upon the house of Uriah. But you must be strong. The way out cannot come unless a little pain comes first. Rei. You called, my lord? Have the messenger from Joab come in. <gasps> my lord. At once, my lord. Tell me again what it was that you reported when you arrived with your message from Joab. As you say, my lord, Joab instructed me to report to you that the men of Ammon proved superior to us so that they came out against us into the field. But we kept pressing them right up to the entrance of the gate, and the shooters kept shooting at your servants from on top of the wall so that some of the servants of the king died. And your servant... Uriah the Hittite died also. Oh, no. Oh. oh, Uriah, my master and owner, what have I done to you? What have I done to you? Oh, that I might have died, I myself, instead of you. This is what you will say to Joab. Do not let this matter appear bad in your eyes, for the sword eats up one as well as another. Intensify your battle against the city and throw it down. Go now, return to Joab, and encourage him. It shall be even as you say, my lord. Oh, oh my lord. I have betrayed my husband and owner, 
And now there is nothing I can do to make it up to him. It is only that he will be spared the disgrace that I have brought upon him. But now that need not be, my dear one. You must go down to your house and mourn for your husband for one week. And then, when the period of your mourning is past, I will send for you, and you will come here and become my wife. Your wife, my lord? What has your maidservant done to deserve such loving kindness from you? You are my dear one. And the child that you carry is my child. Now he will be born in my house. And you will be here with me. And the child will be ours together. Go now to your house until I send for you. I have just seen Bathsheba's little son. What a joy it must be to her. And what a blessing it is that David married her so soon after Uriah was killed in battle. It was soon indeed, Joanna. Her period of mourning was hardly over when the king's messenger stood at the gate of her house ready to conduct her here to be the wife of the king. Another evidence of the loving kindness of our lord the king. Of course. Bathsheba is a very beautiful woman. One well suited to be a queen. Except that well, the king's other wives and concubines... Elishaba, Joanna, are you not yet finished in cleaning the apartment of the king? Come now, the king will be returning soon, and you must be gone. We're through, Rei. It was only that I was just going to say to Joanna... I heard enough to know it better be left unsaid. It is not for the servants of my lord the king to discuss his personal affairs or affairs of state. Oh, I'm not suggesting that I... It's, it's, it's just that we were really rejoicing with Bathsheba over the birth of her son. The son of David and Bathsheba is most welcome and a great comfort to Bathsheba for the death of Uriah, her first husband. It's Even true, so, my, true lord. my lord. Now she is extremely happy as the wife of the king. But come now. Do you not have other matters to attend to? Be off with you. As you say, my Jehovah Lord. bless you, my Lord. Come, Joanna. Oh, my Lord. Nathan the prophet has come to see you. He is waiting outside. Ask him to come in, Rei. At once, my Lord. Come in, Nathan, and may you have peace. Shalom Alecha, my brother. I did not know that you were waiting. Please, come in and sit down. If it would please, my lord, I have an urgent matter that I must bring to your attention. One of a most serious nature, and one which you alone must decide. What is it then, Nathan? Speak. The matter is this way, my lord. There were two men that happened to be in one city. The one rich and the other of little means. The rich man happened to have very many sheep and cattle. But the man of little means had nothing but one female lamb, a small one that he had bought. Go on, Nathan. And he was preserving it alive. And it was growing up with him and with his sons all together. From his morsel it would eat, and from his cup it would drink, and in his bosom it would lie. And it came to be as a daughter to him. I understand. 
After a while, a visitor came to the rich man, but he spared taking some of his own sheep and his own cattle to get such ready for the traveler who had come in to him. Speak on, Nathan. So he took the female lamb of the man of little means and got it ready for the man who had come in to him. As Jehovah is living, the man doing this deserves to die. And for the female lamb, he should make compensation with four as a consequence of the fact that he had done this thing and because he did not have compassion. You yourself are the man. This is what Jehovah, the God of Israel, has said. I myself anointed you as king over Israel, and I myself delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I was willing to give you the house of your Lord and the wives of your Lord into your bosom and to give you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if it were not enough, I was willing to add to you things like these as well as other things. Why did you despise the word of Jehovah? By doing what is bad in his eyes. Uriah the Hittite you struck down with a sword, and his wife you took as your wife, and him you killed by the sword of the sons of Ammon. And now a sword will not depart from your own house to time indefinite as a consequence of the fact that you despised me so that you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to become your wife. This is what Jehovah has said. Here I am raising up against you calamity out of your own house, and I will take your wives under your own eyes and give them to your fellow man and he will certainly lie down with your wives under the eyes of the sun. Whereas you yourself acted in secret, I for my part shall do this thing in front of all Israel and in front of the sun. I, I have sinned against Jehovah. Jehovah, in turn, does let your sin pass by. You will not die. Notwithstanding this, because you have unquestionably treated Jehovah with disrespect by this thing, also the son himself just born to you will positively die. Oh, Jehovah, what have I done? Have I been so blind that I could act with such utter disregard for your righteous law? How could I think for a moment that I could escape the uprightness of your orders? Your judicial decisions are true. They have proved altogether righteous, and I stand condemned by them. 
show me your favor, O oh God, according to your loving kindness. Oh, my Lord, please come quickly. Our child, it's as though something had struck it. It's so sick. Please, my Lord, what can I do? I'm so afraid. I know, my dear one. I, too, am afraid. May Jehovah have mercy on the child. still refuse food? He will eat nothing, Hushai. He mourns deeply for his son. How is the child? It is getting weaker every moment. And so is our Lord, the King. You speak truly, Shemyai. But we have tried to raise him up, and he continues to refuse to eat bread in company with us. He entreats Jehovah constantly in behalf of the boy. But the child continues to grow weaker. It is as though Jehovah has turned his face away from the child. Jehovah is a loving God. Perhaps he will be entreated by the king. Perhaps indeed. I fear for both the king and for Bathsheba. Let us retire for a while. Then, perhaps we can again stand over him and endeavor to raise him up from the earth. Turn, please, your anger away from the child, O oh God. For what is the sin that it has committed? Show me favor in this God of my salvation, and turn upon me the penalty of my sin. I have unquestionably treated you with disrespect, broken your perfect law, ignored your trustworthy reminders, and forsaken your upright orders. But can you not in your tender mercies, O oh God, show me your favor? And let the child live. Show me favor, O oh God, according to your loving kindness. According to the abundance of your mercies, wipe out my transgressions. Thoroughly wash me from my error and cleanse me even from my sin. For my transgressions I myself know. And my sin is in front of me constantly. Against you, you alone I have sinned. And what is bad in your eyes, I have done. In order that you may prove to be righteous when you speak, that you may be in the clear when you judge. Look, with error I was brought forth with birth pains. And in sin, my mother conceived me. Look, you have taken delight in truthfulness itself, in the inward parts, and in the secret self, may you cause me to know sheer wisdom. May you purify me from sin with hyssop that I may be clean. May you wash me that I may become whiter even than snow. May you cause me to hear exultation and rejoicing, 
that the bones that you have crushed may be joyful. Conceal your face from my sins and wipe out even all my errors. Create in me even a pure heart, O oh God, and put within me a new spirit, a steadfast one. Do not throw me away from before your face and your Holy Spirit, O oh, do not take away from me. Do restore to me the exaltation of salvation by you and may you support me even with a willing spirit. I will teach transgressors your ways that sinners themselves may turn right back to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O oh God, the God of my salvation, that my tongue may joyfully tell about your righteousness. O oh Jehovah, may you open these lips of mine, that my own mouth may tell forth your praise. For you do not take delight in sacrifice, Otherwise, I would give it. In whole burnt offerings, you do not find pleasure. The sacrifices to God are a broken spirit, a heart broken and crushed. Oh, God, you will not despise. In your goodwill, do deal well with Zion. May you build the walls of Jerusalem. In that case, you will be delighted with sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt sacrifices and whole offering. In that case, bulls will be offered up on your very own altar. See how our Lord the King still implores Jehovah for the child. It is useless to try to raise him up from the earth. How he must love the child. Shimei. Yes, what is it? I wouldn't have the King disturbed. I know, my Lord, but it's something you must know. Very well, what is it? We've just received word, my Lord, that the baby has died. Died? Yes, my lord. Elisha has just reported that the infant has died. Then Jehovah has indeed turned his face away from the child. What now can we tell our lord? How can we tell this matter to him? But we must. We cannot keep it from him. But look. While the child continued to live, we did speak to him, but he did not listen to our voice. So how can we say to him, the child has died? Then he will certainly do something bad. Hushai, Rei, Shimei, has the child died? He has died. Jehovah is a just and righteous God. Life has indeed gone for life. May Jehovah forgive me of my sin. It is before me constantly. Rei, have fresh water brought that I may bathe and bring me oil and a change of mantles. I am going to the house of Jehovah. Then, when I return, set bread before me that I may eat. What does this thing mean that you have done? For the sake of the child while alive, you fasted and kept weeping. 
And just as soon as the child had died, you get up and begin to eat bread. While the child was yet alive, I did fast, and I kept weeping, because I said to myself, who is there knowing whether Jehovah may show me favor, and the child will certainly live. Now that he has died, why is it that I am fasting? Am I able to bring him back again? I am going to him. But as for him, he will not return to me. Jehovah has indeed blessed us, Bathsheba. And has given me another beautiful son. But do you think, can we be sure, my Lord, that... That you... this one will not also be taken away? I could not bear it, my Lord. If we were to lose this child also, I... I know it would bring my soul down to Sheol. I'm sure, my dear one, that Jehovah will reveal himself to us some way in the matter. My sin is in front of me constantly. Yet I know that Jehovah has forgiven me, for he himself well knows the formation of us, remembering that we are dust. Oh, David, my Lord, the psalm that you composed, a psalm of thanksgiving, of the happiness of forgiveness, and of trust in God. Please, my Lord, let me hear it again. As you say, my dear one, it brings me great comfort as well. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, his loving kindness is superior toward those fearing him. As far off as the sunrise is from the sunset, so far off from us he has put our transgressions. is the one whose revolt is pardoned, whose sin is covered. Happy is the man to whose account Jehovah does not put error, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wore out through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My life's moisture has been changed as in the dry heat of summer. My sin I finally confessed to you, and my error I did not cover. I said, I shall make confession over my transgressions to Jehovah, and you yourself pardon the error of my sins.
on this account, every loyal one will pray to you at such a time only as you may be found. As for the flood of many waters, they will not touch him himself. You are a place of concealment for me. You will safeguard me from distress itself. With joyful cries at providing escape, you will surround me. I shall make you have insight and instruct you in the way you should go. I will give advice with my eye upon you. Do not make yourselves like a horse or mule without understanding, whose spirit in this is to be curbed even by bridle or halter before they will come near to you. Many are the pains that the wicked one has. But as for the one trusting in Jehovah, loving kindness itself surrounds him. Rejoice in Jehovah and be joyful, you righteous ones, and cry out joyfully, all you who are upright in heart. Oh, David, my Lord, it is beautiful. How merciful and full of loving kindness is our God Jehovah. How much we have to thank him for. How much indeed. Who can utter the mighty performances of Jehovah? Or who can make all his praise to be heard? Jehovah is near to all those calling upon him. To all those who call upon him in trueness. He has proved to be near to us. May he always prove to be so. My sin is in front of me constantly. Yet I know Jehovah is near me to preserve me and sustain me. But one thing we must never forget, Bathsheba, my dear one. The judgment which Jehovah pronounced against me by the mouth of Nathan his prophet has not yet been completely executed against me. Our first son is dead at God's hand. This he foretold, and it was fulfilled. What heartbreak is yet ahead of me, I cannot say. But come it will. May Jehovah give me the discernment to recognize it and the fortitude to bear it. I will not lift up my hand against this just judgment. It is of God. He has not done to me even according to my sins, nor according to my errors as he brought upon me what I deserve. Oh, David, my Lord, are you suggesting... Do you mean our son? I do not know. According to the word of Jehovah by Nathan his prophet, the sword will not depart from my house to the day of my death. Calamity will be raised up against me out of my own house, and my wives will be taken under my own eyes and given to my fellow man. This is my punishment for forgetting my God. When and how it will come, I do not know, but come it will. This is the scar that remains from my sin, a scar that I must carry with me in the shield. You must carry this scar to your death, and yet Jehovah has forgiven you? It is even so. The judicial decision of Jehovah is a vast, watery deep. 
It cannot go unfulfilled. Yet, Jehovah has promised he will not for all time keep finding fault. Neither will he to time indefinite keep resentful. This is my consolation. May Jehovah be praised to time indefinite. Come in. Excuse me, my lord, but Nathan would speak with you. Have him come in, Rei. Shalom, my lord the king, and peace to you also, Bathsheba. Shalom Alecha, Nathan. May Jehovah's Spirit continue with you, Nathan, my lord. Do you have some word for us from Jehovah? I do. Is it good news? It is good news. It is a day for rejoicing. Oh, may Jehovah be praised. Jehovah has indeed turned his face toward you and has caused his face to shine upon you. The child Bathsheba has born to you, David, has been blessed by Jehovah, and Jehovah himself does love the child. He has sent by means of me and has called the child's name Jedidiah for the sake of Jehovah, beloved of Jah. Jehovah is indeed merciful and full of loving kindness. Jedidiah? This is the name by which he will be called? Jedidiah is his name because he is beloved by Jehovah. But Solomon he shall be called, and by the name Solomon he shall be known because he is indeed the one of whom Jehovah spoke to David, saying, Look, there is a son being born to you. He himself will prove to be a restful man, and I shall certainly give him rest from all his enemies all around. For Solomon is what his name will become, and peace and quietness I shall bestow upon Israel in his days. It is he that will build a house to my name, and he himself will become a son to me, and I a father to him. And I shall certainly establish the throne of his kingship firmly over Israel to time indefinite. Even so. And as Jehovah lives, so shall Solomon succeed me to the throne of Israel, and I will make his throne strong and make preparation for him that he may build a lasting house to Jehovah and that he may do all the things that Jehovah requires of him. So be it. It is even as Jehovah has spoken. Could David ever have done anything so bad as that? It's obvious that he was thinking only of himself and his own personal desires. At least for the moment, he forgot God in serving him. He didn't keep his mind fixed on the right things. Exactly. But uh, were these other judgments against him fulfilled? Yes, all of them. One tragic circumstance after another arose in David's life as a constant reminder of what he'd done. What happened? Well, as you know, he lost the child born to Bathsheba, but later Tamar, a daughter by another wife, was violated by her own half-brother Amnon. Oh, my, how awful. Then her full brother Absalom, all of them David's children, 
killed Amnon in revenge. Oh. Then, in due time, Absalom, who had been shown mercy by David, usurped David's throne, and David had to flee from Jerusalem. Only after Absalom was killed, against David's express wishes, was David restored to the throne. What a tragic record. Oh. Yes, but in all of this, David refused to resist the judgment of God, and his continued attitude of repentance enabled him to maintain the relationship to Jehovah, which he'd won back due to his confession of guilt to Jehovah. Then David did pay bitterly for his wrong course of action, even though he was forgiven. And the record that he's made will stand for all time. But now, there's a brighter side of this picture, too, you know. What could that possibly be? Yes, what do you mean? Well, certainly we can be warned not to follow in David's wrong course of action. But for those who do commit sin, what a wonderful example they have in David's sincere and heartfelt repentance. Yes, I can see that all right. But that's something else I'm not quite clear on yet. How can we be sure that someone really has repented of his wrong course? Brother Olderman said a while ago that we can see his changed course of action. Yes, I know. But that may be after he's been disfellowshipped. I mean, how can you tell at the time he's found mm. out, right then, or when he comes to confess to the elders? Yes, how about that, Brother Olderman? It isn't always easy, Bob, because man cannot look into the heart of another man. Only God can do that. But repentance is more than just saying, I'm sorry. It's more than just breaking into tears and saying, I'm sorry. But if someone does say that, especially in tears, don't you think he's truly repentant? He could be in sincere grief, yes. But the question the Judicial Committee has to decide is, what motivates his grief? Is he disturbed because he's been caught? Because of the social stigma that's become attached to him as a marked man? One will not be well thought of? Or is he grieved because he's broken God's law? Because he's brought disgrace on Jehovah God himself and on his organization? Ah, there is a difference then in the grief someone caught in sin can express. Just as surely as there's a difference in the outcome. Paul wrote to the Corinthians at 2 Corinthians 7, 10, For sadness in a godly way makes for repentance to salvation that is not to be regretted. But the sadness of the world produces death. Cain expressed sadness for his wrong deed, too. He was sorry for himself due to the bleak future he foresaw. But he expressed no regret over the act of murdering his brother. So Cain's was the sadness of the world. Yes, and it led to his death. Godly sadness, on the other hand, is possible only when the penitent hates this act that he's performed so much that he cannot bring himself to repeat the act. He must be deeply concerned with the wrongness of what he did and the wrong desires that led him to follow that course. If his sadness is in a godly way, his repentance will cause him to want to turn around and change his course of action. And this will be clearly manifest to those who are searching his heart through at the time he makes his confession. So, we must be moved by a hatred of what is bad, as well as a love of righteousness. Otherwise, there would be no real force to repentance. And so, the repentant one would not be motivated to follow through with what Paul called works that befit repentance. What should someone do then, Brother Alderman, who's committed some sin that he thinks is quite serious? He should go to the older men in the congregation and tell them about it. This is the counsel James gives. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Openly confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may get healed. A righteous man's supplication, when it is at work, has much force. You mean the older men can forgive him his sin? No, no, Peggy. They can forgive him for any reproach he may have brought on the congregation and for any difficulty he may have caused the brothers. But only Jehovah can pardon his sin. But can't the one sinning pray to Jehovah and have God forgiving? Of course, and he should, if he can still pray. But you see, Peggy, sin is an evidence of spiritual illness, 
and sometimes the one sinning feels his prayer will not be heard. So by going to the elders, he can become healed and regain spiritual health and strength through their prayers for him. That's what James means by saying, pray for one another, and a righteous man's supplication has much force. Oh. It's part of their work as shepherds. However, there's another reason for going to the elders too, Peggy. What's that? It's because these brothers are also concerned with protecting the spiritual health of the congregation as a whole, guarding against its becoming infected. When we seek to cooperate with the elders this way, it's further evidence of our goodwill towards God and our desire to correct the wrong we've committed. I see. But suppose we haven't committed a sin as serious as David's. Should we still go to the elders? If we need help, by all means. We're all imperfect, and many times we may be guilty of having lofty eyes or showing favoritism or an improper use of the tongue. As James said, we all stumble many times. I guess I do that all right. Well, now, Peggy, I know you're concerned about your relations with God. Oh, yes. Then it's proper to repent and turn around in every such instance, seeking his forgiveness. I will, Brother Olderman. And if you ever feel you need help from the elders to recognize these tendencies and to work to control them, then don't hesitate to go to them. I won't, Brother Olderman. I guess we all sin every day, all right. But doesn't that mean that we're constantly going to be in a state of mourning and that we'll be continually feeling remorseful? Not at all. Joy is one of the principal fruits of God's Holy Spirit. And the psalmist says, If errors were what you watch, O Jehovah, who could stand? But I'm sorry for my errors. That's good, Peggy. They should bring regret. But we don't need to torture ourselves over every minor fault or thoughtless word. Just the same, I feel pretty small when I look back on them. They do humble us, and recognizing our faults helps us to be compassionate toward others. Then, when we pray to God for forgiveness of our daily errors, he'll be pleased with our prayer. And if we keep this attitude of mind, we'll be much less likely to fall into the kind of sin that caused David so much heartache. Or that would cause us to be put out of the organization. That's right, Linda. Am I right in concluding then, Brother Olderman, that we all have these sinful tendencies and wrong desires in us because we've inherited them from Adam and Eve? But if we put them out of our mind and refuse to dwell on them, we can still overcome them. We most certainly can. It's strength from Jehovah through his spirit that enables us to do it. So we must rely on him, keeping our minds fixed on the things above. And if we work at it and constantly maintain a repentant attitude for the things we do wrong, Jehovah will most certainly protect and preserve us. There's a song in our songbook that highlights this theme of repentance and of God's forgiveness. It's song number 56. Here, get out your songbooks, and let's look at the words. And from now on, whenever you sing this song in our kingdom hall, let it remind you of David's sincere repentance and of our constant need to be in this same repentant frame of mind in order to have God's forgiveness. Oh, Brother Olderman, I feel like singing it right now. Good. Why not? Here, let's put the record on. And let's all of us sing it. Number 56. Ready? Everybody sing with tenderness and sincere appreciation of God's mercy. 